if you'd like to give a perception lecture, is have one of your students organize the meeting. <laughs> anyway, it's uh, such a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, and I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me. Uh, they've done a bang-up job. And uh, I want to mention Oliver and Ian and Slobodin and uh, Sunchitsa, and of course the godfather of perception in Belgrade, Dejan Todorovic. So they've done a wonderful job. And I think that, like me, you're going to enjoy your stay here. I've been here already for three or four days. And uh, the food is excellent. You'll discover that. And uh, there's many wonderful parks. And uh, it's a very interesting city, interesting architecture. But you'll see all of that. So I appreciate all of you coming here. Um, my topic for this evening, I thought I would talk about lightness perception. <laughs> anyway, um, I had some other topics in mind, but OK, so let me try to get started here. So theories of lightness, now lightness, by the way, uh, I guess not everybody works in lightness perception. Uh, lightness is the perceived white, black, or gray shade of a surface. OK, so we're talking about the perception of an object property, a surface property. We're not talking about the perception of light. That would be brightness, actually. Um, and lightness theories are conventionally broken down into three categories, high, low, and mid-level theories. Uh, but I want to suggest that, actually, there's only really two uh, categories, because in general, I think that low-level theories tend to add a high-level component. And by and large, high-level theories take for granted a low-level component. So I want to talk about one-stage versus two-stage theories. And uh, the two-stage theories that I want to sort of uh, criticize today, uh, it's a familiar idea of a sensory stage and a cognitive stage. It goes back uh, to the beginning of our field. And this idea is alive and well today. And I don't think that either one of these stages actually exists. So that's going to be sort of the theme of what I want to argue today. So is there a sensory stage? Well, first of all, even if you talk to people that are ardent supporters of the idea of a sensory stage, they acknowledge that it's very difficult to observe these sensations, OK? So here are some quotes by, by Helmholtz, by von Kries, and by Katz. And uh, they all believed in sensations, but they found it very difficult to, to, to spot them. We know that matching proximal qualities is very difficult, as opposed to matching objective properties of the distal stimulus. Uh, I'm indebted to Barbara Gillum for this uh, example here. And it's a better example if you're actually uh, not looking at a photograph. But she points out that if you ask a subject uh, to look at the line where the floor meets the wall on the left and the line where the, the ceiling meets the wall on the right, and you ask a subject, are those two lines collinear in your retinal image? Subjects find this a very, very difficult task. Now, you may find it a little easier in this slide, because it's easier to do in a picture. But when you're in a room, that's a very hard task. On the other hand, if you ask people, are those two edges, are they parallel in the world, that's quite easy to do. Subjects have no trouble with that task. Here's Ted Adelson's checkered shadow. If we ask the question, which of those two squares is brighter, what's the relative brightness of those two squares? That's a very difficult task. The lightness is not difficult, right? You see immediately when you look at this that uh, the square on the right is a lighter shade of gray than the one on the left. But which one is reflecting more light? That's tough. Now, we know that these two squares reflect the same amount of light. Um, people have defended raw sensations in various ways. Uh, Stumpf argued that we have raw sensations, but we just don't notice them. And I recommend reading. Uh, Kurler's uh, blistering critique of that idea. Another more plausible way of defending raw sensations is to argue that we have raw sensations, but they're overridden by the percept, by that second stage. They're sort of masked out. Okay? And various people have argued that they have found ways of revealing the existence of those sensations. So. Uh, Sekuler and Palmer, in a very influential paper back in 1992, uh, proposed that early on there's what they call a mosaic stage. If you talk about a, a stimulus like this, uh, an interposition stimulus, where uh, this uh, square covers up a, a disk there, 
they argue that after about 200 milliseconds, you know, the, the, the white circle, uh, the white disk uh, functions in priming experiments as a, as a circle, as a disk, but that before that, it functioned like a mosaic, like a Pac-Man. Now, uh, uh, I, I have recently taken a closer look at that paper, and I, I'll argue that, that the, it's, the data are not very, really very convincing. Uh, now, Steve and I may go head to head with this, uh, on this after my talk, but uh, uh, I have more to say on this, but I don't want to take too much time right now. Uh, then Rauschenberger and Yantis, in a paper in Nature, uh, claimed that they had found evidence for this mosaic stage, and as you see here, but only three years later, Rauschenberger and colleagues uh, had to retract that uh, conclusion, and as they said here, our results are quite incompatible with the two-stage model. And I think this kind of thing has happened frequently in the field, where people think they've found these raw sensations, and then it turns out not so much. Uh, Kathleen Moore and her colleague uh, argue that they had found evidence for an early representation of raw luminance. Um, and they did a, uh, it was a search study. They've got, the task for the subject was to find the square in a group of other squares that's just slightly lighter or slightly darker than the others. But the trick was that half of the distractors were under a transparency, a gray transparency. And this was arranged so that in two of the four conditions, uh, the, tar the, the distractors under the shadow happened to have just exactly the same luminance as the target. And she found that in those, exactly those two conditions, uh, reaction time was slowed down significantly. And she argued, uh, they argued, that um, that's evidence of the residual effect of those raw sensations. Well, the fact of the matter is, that logic is only valid if you assume that lightness constancy is 100% perfect. And of course, we know that it never is. It turns out there's a much simpler explanation of this finding. If there's any degree of failure in lightness constancy, then the situation is such that these targets here under the transparency, if they appear even slightly darker than the other distractors, uh, then they're more similar to the target. And so that's going to slow you down. So you can explain this finding at the level of the percept, and you don't need to talk about a sensation here. Now we come to brightness models, one of my favorite topics. There are a lot of brightness models. I'll mention just three of them here uh, almost randomly, but uh, Blakesley and McCourt, uh, I mentioned because they're a widely endorsed model. Uh, Shapiro and Liu have a model that's in incredibly simple, just a high-pass filter, and does a an awful lot of work. And, and Geyer and Hudak have uh, a model that that's worth taking a look at. And there's more models. There's over a dozen of these. I don't know how many brightness models there are. But my question, and by the way, if, if you're wondering, everybody asks, yeah, what's the difference between lightness and brightness? So let's just do that. Uh, lightness is perceived reflectance. Brightness is perceived luminance, OK? And one way to think about it is that lightness is to brightness as perceived size is to perceived visual angle. Now, I've always wondered why there are any models of brightness, let alone many <coughs> models of brightness, because Luminance is not informative. Okay, why does the visual system need to know how much light is coming from some sector of the visual field? Generally speaking, that's not uh, very informative. It's very important to know the reflectance of surfaces, okay? And you know, we don't have any theories of perceived visual angle. If you, if you go into the size and spatial domain, um, you don't find theories of vis perceived visual angle. So it's not clear to me why we have any theories of brightness at all. Because remember what, uh, what Herring said, you know, we don't see light, we see things that reflect light, or words to that effect. Now, when I've asked my brightness modeling friends why study brightness, they, the most common answer I get is that brightness is the first stage. The idea is that uh, there's an initial representation of brightness, and then that's followed up by uh, some cognitive process that turns that into lightness, okay? So here's our sensory and cognitive stages again. Well, is lightness really derived from brightness? Uh, I did an, an experiment, kind of a heroic experiment, many years ago with Jim Schubert, 
and Galena will, will remember this experiment, I'm sure. Um, we had observed, we, we wanted to uh, slowly ramp the luminance of a Gonsfeld. And so we had subjects lying on their back underneath an aquarium. Uh, we had a very bright light source above the aquarium, and we had inky water in the aquarium, and we could, we could fill it up or, or slowly empty the aquarium. And so as we changed the level of water in the aquarium in linear fashion, it changed the amount of light transmitted in logarithmic fashion, which is exactly what we wanted, and we could have a huge range, and we didn't change the color of the light, and so forth and so on. The subject uh, was lying on his back here, and he had a translucent contact lens in each eye. The eyelids were taped open because, uh, to avoid blinking. And because we were doing trials that would last up to one hour, we covered the eye. We covered the eye with a section of ping pong ball, and that worked very fine to keep the eyeball moist, and it also added further diffusion. I don't think anybody has ever made a more homogeneous Gonsfeld than we had. And so we changed the, illumin we changed the light on the Gonsfeld very slowly at the rate of three log units per hour. And the question was, at what point can the subject tell us whether the light is getting brighter or dimmer? And our results were that the change in absolute luminance was detected after 10 minutes. It took 10 minutes, which is a threefold change in brightness, before the subject could respond correctly. In a follow-up condition, unfortunately done with a different apparatus, we had subjects looking at a, at a stimulus that consisted of a disk within a Gonsfeld. And we would change the brightness of either the disk or the Gonsfeld at that same slow rate, keeping the other part constant. And here the question was, how soon can the subject detect a change in relative luminance? And that was detected in approximately one minute. So if a change in relative luminance is detected 10 times faster than a change in absolute luminance, it seems to me that that works against the idea that lightness comes from brightness. Now you might say, but isn't relative luminance a relationship between two absolute values? Not necessarily. Take the example of a balance beam. You can find out the relative weight of two people without ever knowing the absolute weight of either one. You put them on two ends of a seesaw, and you move the fulcrum until you get a balance, and then the relative distance of each person from the fulcrum tells you the relative weight. But you never know the absolute weight of either one. And I think that's the same thing that Yarbus was trying to say about the role of eye movements and stabilized images that we're really picking up directly the relative luminance, and you don't necessarily have to go through that luminance stage. You know, I think we know the same thing in motion. The threshold for relative motion is much lower than for absolute motion. If you have one spot of light in a dark room, uh, you have to move it pretty fast before people can tell reliably which way it's moving. But if you have two spots, and one is moving relative to the other, you're extremely sensitive. So I think the logic is the same in motion as in luminance. Now, I've recently been doing some uh, adaptation work in my lab, uh, looking for effects of adaptation on lightness. As far as I know, there's no work on adaptation effects on lightness. Now, I may, be, I may stand corrected here, and so please tell me if you know of any work, but I'm not aware of any work on the effect of adaptation, the effect of adaptation on lightness, and you know, it's typical that people would adapt their subjects. But we're finding no effect. We find, so far in our data, if you're standing in, in total darkness for three minutes or in a very bright field, and then you look at the same Mondrian, uh, we're not getting any, any difference, OK? Now, we know that adaptation has a big effect on brightness. There's lots of work on that. And so if brightness is supposed to be the input for lightness, don't we have a problem here? If adaptation has a big effect on brightness, should that not carry through to lightness? So it seems to me, if my logic is correct here, that that's another argument against the two-stage model. Now, some people, I could mention names, but uh, some people argue that not only there's two stages, but that the brightness stage uh, represents true vision, and the lightness stage represents cognition. People like Mark McCord and Barbara Blakesley, for example. But I won't mention any names. Uh, now, you know, we may get some questions, I'm sure, after my talk on this, but 
Goldfish have lightness constancy and they have color constancy, okay? And do we want to impute cognitive functions to a goldfish? And by the way, I don't think that goldfish can do brightness matching. I'm willing to bet that they can't do brightness matching. But we're going to do some work with chicks. I'm, I'm, I'm doing some collaboration with Valerta Gara, and um, I've just sent a, a, a wonderful young undergraduate uh, who's, who's standing right here, uh, Katerina Yevtic. She went there to learn how to run newborn chicks. So she's trained this chick to go to the gray square there. And there's the gray square, and it gets the food. Now, we, we will do, of course, a lightness constancy experiment, but there's nothing surprising there because uh, it's already been done. Curler's uh, done this before and shown that chicks do have lightness constancy. But we want to go on and do some additional studies, including we want to do, see if they can do brightness uh, perception. And I, I actually don't think that they can. So that time the chick found the gray square right off the bat. So there's these three corridors, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to train the chick to go to the square, the square lid that has a certain absolute brightness, a certain absolute luminance, okay? So from trial to trial, the shade of gray of the lids will change and the illumination on the corridor will change. What the chick has to learn is to go to the square that has the same absolute luminance, okay? And I'm willing to bet that they can't do that after thousands of trials. We'll find out. I think, by the way, if I want to make a prediction that um, I think you can probably train a chick on any property of the world, any distal property, but I don't think you can train these chicks uh, to respond to a property of their own retinal image. That's just my opinion. Now, if sensations don't exist, it raises the question, how do we explain proximal mode of perception, okay? So how do we explain that people have some ability to judge visual angle and they have some ability to judge luminance, and where does that come from? Well, first of all, I, of course, I want to argue that it's not read off of some early uh, image-based representation. Uh, and I want to argue that it's actually a cognitive operation, which I would call flattening the world, OK? If you say to somebody, show somebody a large object far away and a small object nearby, and say, which one has the larger visual angle? Which one makes a larger image on your retina? What do people do? They typically close one eye, and they often line themselves up with the two objects, OK? So why are they doing that? I would suggest that they're trying to imagine the two objects as being at the same distance. In other words, they're trying to sort of flatten the world. And if they can imagine the two objects at the same distance, then they can just exploit their ordinary uh, size perception mechanism uh, and, and read off the results and give you the answer. Um, so I'm actually suggesting, by the way, that the same thing happens with lightness. Uh, by the way, in, in space, in the spatial domain, I think anything that helps you to flatten the world will lead to better visual angle matching. So, for example, monocular viewing will probably do better. Inverting the scene, we know you can do better on, on visual angle matching. And, and, of course, that's sort of what the hallway and boring experiments were showing us. Now, I want to make the same analogy in lightness, and if I can borrow the term, I want to talk about flattening the illumination, that when you try to judge the relative brightness of things in two different levels of illumination, you're trying to imagine the scene as being homogeneously illuminated. So I'm actually trying to reverse the usual idea, and I want to suggest that lightness is true vision. Mark, I saw you there somewhere. And brightness is actually cognitive, so game on, OK? Um, we've been doing these experiments in my lab in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I'm sorry for the poor quality of the slide here, but. Um, we put a light gray square on the wall here. We project a beam of light on the wall. And this is very obvious to the subjects that it's a beam of light. It's an illumination edge there. And on the, in the bright illumination, we have a, a grid of 16 uh, gray squares. And first of all, we, we do lightness matching, and they're very good at that. You know, um, We get more than 90% constancy, and it's, very, it's a very easy task. They, they respond very quickly. And then we ask them to do a brightness match. Now, we've trained them up first. We spend 10 or 15 minutes uh, training them on what we mean by brightness, what we mean by matching the amount of reflected light, and so forth. Uh, but they have a hard time doing it, OK? They find it very hard to do it. Their results are very far from a luminance match. And uh, 
And I mean, I think you have to say in the end that they're guessing. If you talk to the subject and they tell you what their strategies are, they're all over the map. They're, they just don't know what they're doing. Now, in one condition, we have them viewing the same thing through an aperture, and that seems to help them to sort of what I call flatten the illumination. And that, in our results, pushes them significantly closer to a luminance match. So I think there are, again, things that you can do to help subjects make a brightness match. OK, so in the history of science, we find several <laughs> concepts that have finally had to be rejected. OK, and I don't know if you remember the concept of phlogiston. Uh, phlogiston was a, a substance that was supposed to be given off by things when they burn. Things that burn contain phlogiston. And in the end, of course, it turns out there isn't any phlogiston. You remember the ether? How can light waves travel through empty space? The, the light waves must be, space must be filled with something. We're going to call it the ether. But search as they would, they couldn't find any evidence for ether. And so they finally gave it up. And I want to suggest that raw sensations should fall in that same category. It's time to give up the idea. Uh, as Merleau-Ponty said, the alleged self-evidence of sensations is not based on any testimony of consciousness, but on widely held prejudice. OK, what about the cognitive stage? Now, I'm going to argue that there's no cognitive stage. I don't want to necessarily say that there's no effect of cognitive factors on perception, but uh, in general, I don't think there's a cognitive stage, OK? Um, let me start with this challenge, OK? If a baby sees the wrong shade of gray, what's the feedback that's going to correct that? I think that's a very difficult question to answer. And I've asked a lot of people. People say, well, if you move it from the, the baby sees that if you move an object from the light into the shadow, uh, it changes its brightness. But that, you see, assumes the lightness constancy. And you can't, you can't assume that. You see, the baby doesn't know that the object is not changing its color when it goes across that edge. So, I mean, I, you can come up with an explanation here, but I think you're going to end up imputing a very sophisticated cognitive process to the baby. And isn't it a, a lot simpler to simply say that lightness constancy comes hardwired because fish do it anyway? And, you know, is evolution so inefficient that despite millions of years evolving in a world of light and shadow, each organism has to start from scratch and figure it out? And we come now to uh, a topic that I wish I could do a whole lecture on, <laughs> embodied perception, right? So you know this work. Uh, well, first of all, we go back to the 1950s and 60s and the new look. And I won't ask for a show of hands, because it would only be the senior citizens that would respond. But we were told back then that a quarter looks bigger to a poor boy than to a rich boy. This, this work in this genre was very poorly done, and it was soon discredited, OK? But it seems to be making a comeback uh, led by Denny Prophet. And of course, what he's done is he's had subjects judging the steepness of a hill that they're standing in front of. And his claim is that if you're wearing a heavy backpack, the hill looks steeper. Not simply that you report it to be steeper, but it actually looks steeper, OK? As some of you know, uh, Frank Durgan has replicated that study, and he found the same results. But after he ran each subject, he asked them a very interesting question. He said, why do you suppose we asked you to put on a heavy backpack? Yeah. And they said, virtually all the subjects said, I guess you thought it would have an effect on my judgment of slope. And that already shows that they're not naive, right? Even though it says in the methods section that they're naive, they're not naive. And then he says, well, do you think it did have an effect on your judgment? And about only about 20% of the subjects said yes, but they were the only ones that showed the effect. <laughs> he then repeated the experiment with a cover story about that you've got to wear the, uh, the battery pack for some apparatus, and then there was no effect on the steepness of the hill. Now, I don't have time to go into the, some very interesting work of this guy, Chaz Firestone, uh, who doesn't even have his, his degree, his PhD yet, but he's really doing some great work. And he has taken the El Greco fallacy and turned it into a very powerful tool. Uh, if you're not familiar with the El Greco fallacy, briefly, El Greco drew these long, skinny figures. And it was argued in a book by an ophthalmologist that he had an astigmatism that squeezed the retinal image this way. And we call it a fallacy because 
If he drew long, skinny figures, when he looked at his own painting, his astigmatism would stretch them out even more, and it would look wrong. But if he drew them correctly, his eye would squeeze the object and the painting equally, and it would look right. Okay, so that's why it's called a fallacy. Now, Chaz has shown by some very clever experiments that many of these reports in this uh, embodied perception literature are actually committing the El Greco fallacy. I don't have time to go into that, but uh, if you get a chance to, to look into that stuff, it's, 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 I find it entertaining anyway, let's put it that way. I want to suggest that there's, I'm going to go further than, than Firestone, and because what Firestone does with his uh, clever use of the El Greco fallacy is to show that whatever these effects are, they're not effects on vision. I'd like to go a little further and suggest what effects they might be, okay? Number one, I think that the hypotheses in these experiments are pretty transparent. It's not rocket science figuring out, uh, you know, when you're asked to put on a heavy backpack in front of a slope and, ju and judge the slope, okay? And number two, subjects want to please the experimenter, you know, social pressure. Now, maybe you've experienced this same thing, okay? You visit somebody's lab, and they show you their latest effect, and you don't exactly see that effect, but you know what they're looking for. You may not give in to the pressure, you may give an honest response, but you might feel that pressure, okay? And so I'm suggesting that in these experiments, most of the subjects don't give in to the pressure. Most of the subjects call it as they see it, which is fine. But 20% give in to the group pressure, and that's enough to give you statistical significance, and you got your publication. Let's talk for a moment about high-level uh, high lightness theories. Uh, of course, we go back to Helmholtz and taking the illumination into account. There's another type of lightness constancy that's only been, that, that's been revived, you might say, more recently. Katz called it the method of anomalous orientation. Uh, if you take a piece of gray paper and you rotate it relative to the light source, it'll get brighter and darker, but uh, you tend to perceive it as remaining relatively constant in lightness. It's not a high degree of constancy. But this has recently been taken up in the laboratories of Larry Maloney and David Brainerd, and uh, they, they both attributed the constancy that they found to the notion that the visual system is taking into account, is estimating the direction and intensity of the light source, and then plugging that into some physical formula that's embedded in your brain. Well, first of all, I want to point out that it's rarely the case that there's only one light source. I mean, you know, in a situation like this, for example, what's the direction and intensity of the light source on that desk right there? I mean, there's a dozen lights on the ceiling, there's, there's light coming in through the windows, and don't forget, every surface is reflecting light onto other surfaces. So even in the natural world, where there's only the sun, perhaps, there are always rocks and other things nearby that reflect light. So in modern scenes like this, I just don't find it plausible that you could estimate the direction and intensity of, the light so of all of these light sources. I just think that the computational load is enormous. And besides, there's an easier, there's a much easier, a much simpler way to go about things, and that, well, I'll come to that in a moment. Well, okay, here's just a couple of uh, fun paintings by Konitz uh, arguing, you know, against, or, or arguing that past experience is very easily overridden by, by cues from within the stimulus. The knife looks transparent, even though you don't have any uh, past experience with transparent knives. And these peasants appear to be tangled up in the fence, and you've never seen that before, but this is really an example of the Petter effect, which is kind of trying to minimize the, the, the length of uh, subjective contour. Mary Peterson, of course, uh, argues that past experience is used to determine the border ownership of an edge. But of course, there's a logical problem here, right? Past experience cannot play a role until after the border ownership is determined. In other words, you can't engage your past experience with horses until you've first assigned the border to the black side, and then you see the horse. So there's a little bit of a problem here, it seems to me. Now I have to make a concession to uh, my, my wonderful colleague, Carl Gegenfurtner, and, and his colleagues, who have done some very clever experiments in, on, on memory color. And uh, not, in my book, I had reviewed, at that point, in 2006, all of the previous work on memory color, and I argued there wasn't any good evidence for memory color. But uh, then these guys come along, and they've done really 
uh, use some very excellent methods, and uh, I can't uh, find anything wrong with, with their experiment. I'm, I'm still working on it. But um, <laughs> uh, I will say, however, that uh, yeah, what, the, what they did, by the way, is they, they, uh, they asked the subjects to take a banana, and, and, and a, they could control the color of the banana, and they asked the subjects to set it to neutral. And they actually set the banana color to a slightly bluish color, OK? Uh, very nice method. But again, keep in mind, I don't know how important a factor this is, because there aren't that many diagnostic objects in the world. If I ask you to look around the auditorium now and tell me where you could use memory color, probably nothing. There, no, you need bananas. If you have bananas, you're in great shape, you know? Anyway, let's move on. So if we were to reject these two-stage models, uh, we're left with single-stage models. And we talk about single-stage models. I think we're really talking about Gestalt theory. Uh, and nowadays, I think it would be fair to say that these come in two different, uh, two different classes, layer models and framework models. So let's just take a quick look. Layer models emerged around the time of the cognitive revolution, the computer revolution. And uh, they can be called decomposition models because you're sort of trying to decompose the retinal image into those factors that combine to create the image in the first place. Uh, they follow the logic of inverse optics. So Bergstrom had a nice, uh, has a nice uh, theory that the image is decomposed into common and relative components in the reflected light, very much analogous to uh, his mentor Gunnar Johansson's theory of, of motion perception. Uh, Adelson and Pentland came along later on with a very similar model, but couched in this wonderful theater workshop metaphor. Uh, Barrow and Tenenbaum coined the term, uh, coined the term intrinsic image uh, model, and uh, I came along with my own uh, intrinsic image theory. I argued in 1979 that uh, the visual system encodes the edges directly, encodes the luminance ratios. It then classifies them as either a change of reflectance or a change of illumination. And then it integrates the edges, but only within classes. And so basically, the idea was that this is a method for parsing the retinal image into two overlapping layers, as if we perceive a layer of illumination projected onto uh, a, pattern of, uh, it, a pattern of surface reflectance. These layer models have certain strengths. They're very good at explaining veridical perception. And unlike the contrast models that preceded them, they explain, they explicitly recognize the perception of illumination, and they explain it. Uh, and I think they're consistent with visual experience, because I think we do see the world as if there's a kind of a layer of illumination on top of the, of the surface albedo. But they have certain weaknesses as well. In those days, they didn't have an anchoring rule. Uh, number two, uh, they were not very good at explaining lightness illusions. And they were not very good at explaining failures of constancy. Now, as far as the anchoring rule, uh, that turned out to be a very simple matter. Uh, my student Zhao Junli and I wanted to present observers with two shades of gray that fill your entire visual field in order to see whether we wanted to test two existing suggestions that either the highest luminance looks white or that the average luminance always looks middle gray. And so we put people into this dome here, and we painted the dome with two shades of gray, middle gray on the left, black on the right, and everybody saw the left side as white and the right side as middle gray. It's a very robust finding, and I can't bring it and demonstrate it for you, but I invite everybody to visit my lab, which is in the New York City area, and you all go to New York City once uh, in your lifetime. You have to make a, a pilgrimage, of course. So just send me an email or whatever, and. Uh, We'll put your head in the apparatus. <laughs> so we found, then, that the highest luminance looks white, OK? And uh, the average luminance is not necessarily middle gray. That's not the anchor. The anchor is, is white. Oh, by the way, uh, you may have noticed, if you're into, into lightness, that uh, Bart Anderson and his colleagues have recently made the claim that they found a case where the highest luminance looks middle gray, not white, OK? And, uh, I think what's happening in their, I'll just mention briefly, I think what's happening in their experiment, uh, the conditions for getting that, they claim, is you have to have a laboratory that's painted entirely black, you have to have the illumination level set very, very low, and you have to have a Mondrian with a very truncated range. Uh, 
and according to them, you'll get this result. Now, we've, we've tried to replicate that and not been successful, and I'm happy that they finally published it because now it, it says in their methods section that after the subject looks at the Mondrian, they then walk, I mean, they're brought into the, into the black room blindfolded, but then to make their match, they're, they're walked into a neighboring room that's illuminated without being blindfolded, and then they go back in for the next trial and back and forth and back and forth. Well, I think there's something in that walking back and forth between the two rooms that accounts for their results because what we do is our, our observers memorize the Munsell scale. So they don't have to go between two rooms. They just go in there and tell us what it looks like. And the lowest setting we got, when we have the illumination down to the lowest level, our photometer will read, so it takes the subjects a few minutes to even see anything, as soon as they see the Mondrian, they call the highest luminance, in that case, an 8.3, which is kind of a poor white. Now, as far as failures of constancy, uh, can you explain those with layer models? There have been several attempts. I made one attempt. Uh, you could possibly do it with a thing called partial integration. So if you assume that edges are not exclusively categorized as either reflectance or illumination, but there are errors in the edge classification process. Uh, you can get some mileage out of that. Um, it helps to explain the fact that a, a piece of gray paper will look darker in shadow than otherwise. But you can't explain gamut compression, OK? Now, let me show you, um, let me show you gamut compression, by the way. Now, I, I, I'll show you a little demonstration of gamut compression. And I, I want to apologize for people that have seen this a dozen times and they're sick of it. But for those that haven't seen it before, you may enjoy it. So I want to show you this one square here. And uh, uh, I hope it's fair to say that that square looks white. I would normally do this in a, in a fully illuminated room, but I, I brought this really big piece of apparatus all the way over here. It's a stage light. It's a wonderful light. And just forgot to bring the bulb. And it's a special bulb because, you know, they have different electricity over here. And so anyway, I, I have to head to dim the lights in the room for this. But OK, so that square looks white. Now, if I put a square next to that that's brighter than that, we know that that won't look white, that that's going to make that look a little bit grayish, OK? That's generally been called brightness induction. But uh, let me do that to show you what happens. We put something brighter next to it. Now the square doesn't look completely white, OK? The new square, of course, looks completely white until I add another square. And then that square looks white, and the other two get a little darker. And, but then I can add another one, of course. And every time I add another brighter square, the other squares get a little bit darker. I did this experiment years ago because I wanted to test whether this darkening effect, this so-called brightness induction, was a matter of uh, contrast or, or like lateral inhibition or whether it's a matter of anchoring. I was beginning to think it, it was a, a matter of anchoring, OK? So how can we tease these apart? Well, I use the spatial function of lateral inhibition. Lateral inhibition is thought to drop off precipitously with distance across the retina. So the target square was this first square on the left here. And uh, as we added higher and higher brightness, uh, brightnesses, they got farther and farther away from the target square. So the question was, does the effect get weaker and weaker? And the answer that we found was, no, it doesn't. What matters is only how much you push up the highest luminance, OK? So that's why I did the experiment, OK? But there was a serendipitous finding that came out of this work, which I'll show you now. The square on the left began, of course, by looking white. And now it doesn't look white. It may look like a middle or even possibly a light gray square. But the square on the left is completely black, OK? Now, what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll shut off the slide projector. And I, I hope you can see that. But we have the whole range of squares uh, of shades of gray from black to white here. But for some reason, when we put them in a spotlight, there's this very dramatic compression of the gamut. And this came as a total surprise to me. I fully expected that by the time we added the final white square, that the first square would look totally black. And so this is what's called what, we're, what I'm calling gamut compression. And this was a real blow to the, my intrinsic image model, because this should be a no-brainer for that model. 
Uh, there's no question that the system can pick up the edges here. Uh, the, the edge classification problem should be easy. Uh, the edges between the squares are sharp, and they divide coplanar surfaces, so they should be reflectance edges. And the occlusion boundary around the whole group would normally be thought to be an illumination edge, so what's the problem? Why, why did, the, did that model fail so badly? Well, in thinking about this and working with this uh, effect, uh, we found, first of all, that this effect only exists when this spotlight is in the presence of a room that's more dimly illuminated than the spotlight. It's a matter of the relative illumination of the two. If you just had those five squares, if they could fill your entire visual field, you would not get this compression, okay? So it's something about the adjacency of the two levels of illumination. And so uh, that led me to propose this uh, sort of anchoring theory that uh, each square is seen partly in relationship to the the local framework of these five squares, and also partly in relationship to the global framework, meaning your whole visual field. Well, I discovered that, uh, okay, actually, here's the, uh, on the screen, you see the, uh, uh, the sort of analysis of it. Here's our data. And the way the theory goes is that if you were to anchor each of these squares locally in their local framework, they should be seen vertically. They should fall in this diagonal line. But if you anchor them globally, then the idea is that every square has a luminance at least as high as a white in the room. And so that, that would be a horizontal line up there. And when you do a weighted average of local and global for each square, uh, you are able, you, you're basically compromising between this global line and this local line, and you end up with this uh, good time for the battery to run up. And you end up with the actual data here. And you even see that the, that the error bars have, have a gradient, too. Uh, then I found out that, uh, and I, uh, Dejan Todorovic, uh, I, I, I was able to convince him to kindly translate this wonderful book by Lajos Kardos, who is a brilliant but uh, neglected Gestalt psychologist from Budapest, and uh, he has a, a wonderful book called Object and Shadow, and if you want a copy, I can, I can send you an electronic copy of it. Uh, and when I read that book, I was so excited because I found that Kardos had had the same idea which he called co-determination. So he says that, for example, for that target there, in a lightness constancy test, uh, it, this is its relevant field, and that's what produces the constancy. But there's some influence from the foreign field, and that's what induces the failures of constancy. So Kardos really, I think, had the first theory of failures of constancy. On the, on, on the heels of that, I, I thought about an experiment to put this idea of co-determination in a head-to-head -head test against classified edge integration, okay? And I'll try to, I'll, I've tried to demonstrate that over here. And so you see in this display here, you see two squares. And I think that it would be fair to say that the square on the left looks white. There's probably no uh, ambiguity about that. Uh, the square on the right looks very light gray, but possibly, I don't know exactly what shade you see it, but when we ran this in the laboratory, it came out as, as some light gray. I forget the value exactly, okay? Well, the fact of the matter is, the square on the left, let's see, how can I do this? Uh, well, I could turn, I, I don't know if this will work. Let me turn this off. The square on the left is actually middle gray, and the square on the right is white, OK? Um, or maybe I could do it, maybe I could do it like this. Do it like this, you see, OK? So there's a big difference between them, OK? Now, according to classified edge integration, again, this should be quite easy, OK? Uh, we made sure that we had a penumbra here, and you may not be able to see the penumbra so well from the back, but in our laboratory, it was very obvious. All the subjects saw that it was a difference of illumination, okay? So the visual system, according to intrinsic image theory, should be able to integrate from, from the white square over here to the gray square and not include this edge in the integration, and it should be able to see that the square on the right is much lighter than the square on the left. On the other hand, according to, according to anchoring theory, the square on the left is not only the highest luminance in the local framework, but it's also the highest luminance in the whole display, and so it should definitely be seen as white. The one on the right is the highest luminance in the local framework, but it's not the highest luminance in the global, so it should appear as a kind of an off-white. And we, I didn't think we'd get that result. I was sure that that result would actually support intrinsic image theory, and when it didn't, uh, <laughs> I became a believer in anchoring theory. Back to Helmholtz. Helmholtz, of course, said that we take the illumination into account, right? 
But you know, we don't have to know the illumination level. And this goes back to an idea that Rock, Irvin Rock put in my mind many years ago, and it, it, it germinated after, after some time. We don't need to know the illumination level. We just have to know which surfaces have the same illumination. And that's the idea of a framework. That's the idea of a, of a perceptual group that I want to talk about. If you can segregate a bunch of patches in the retinal image that are standing under common illumination, uh, then you've, you've held illumination constant within that group, and any further differences have to be reflectance differences. Oh, and I want to distinguish this from the, the notion of perceptual grouping that we're, we're, we're used to from Gestalt psychology. Uh, Wertheimer talked about the need to organize the image and, and, and create objects. So, for example, the traditional idea of grouping is that you're grouping, I, I call it grouping by reflectance. You take these two halves of the book and you have to group them together so that you can see a book, okay? But I'm talking about grouping by illumination, which is grouping this region here and this region here, and that's what gives you the lightness of the book. So these two types of, of perceptual grouping, and they both follow the Gestalt laws, by the way, uh, and I think they're complementary. And so, by the way, later on we come to the question of, of how, do you, how do you segregate these frameworks in the visual field? Well, part of your work is done if you've already segregated things into, into objects, like the book here. So framework, these framework models have strengths and weaknesses also. They explain constancy and they explain failures of constancy. And I think they can rather successfully be applied to lightness illusions. They have several weaknesses. Um, they, they fail in some tests. They, they don't currently, the model currently doesn't refer to perceived illumination. We're about to fix that. Uh, and there's a problem called hypercompression. And by the way, if you want to read more about the failures of this model, I have a section in my book called Shortcomings of the Theory. And by the way, I want to recommend that everybody should put that section in their papers or their books or whatever. Uh, now, illumination perception, turns out it's probably going to be quite easy to incorporate that into the model. Here's some work I've been doing with Alessandro Saranzo. Um, we've got two windows in a... In a People are in this vision tunnel in the far wall. There's these two windows, and they can independently control the illumination in the two windows, and they have to set the illumination in the two windows to be equal. And we find that subjects clearly match illumination level for the highest luminance, not for the average. And I think you can see, even from this slide, these two windows have the same average luminance, but I think it's not a very good picture, but you can see the illumination looks a little brighter in the right-hand window, okay? And this, of course, contradicts a lot of people like Helmholtz and Katz, who said, who suggested that it's average luminance that gives us our illumination level, but it seems to be highest luminance instead. And that's consistent with some more recent work by Kozaki, Noguchi, and so forth. And so there's that. Uh, now, as far as the segregation factors, what are the factors in the retinal image that allow us to find these frameworks in the image? Uh, well, I would suggest three factors uh, that are the same ones that were suggested by, by Kardosh, uh, cast edges, attached edges, and occlusion edges. And uh, this is for, for Lydia. Um, edge, edge, well, that's, that's just a private message for, for uh, Lydia Maniatis. If you're interested, she has written a critique of anchoring theory in, uh, in was, it, was it Vision Research or Journal of Vision? Huh? Vision research, okay, and I've made a response, and uh, I, I'm very grateful to Lydia for, uh, for her critique, because this is the way theories get better, I hope. But I want to make the point, though, that because this, this segmentation problem is often thrown up to me, uh, and, you know, uh, it's a tough problem. I mean, I'm not suggesting that this is a simple problem. It's a tough problem. But I want to make the point that this is not just a problem for anchoring theory. This segmentation problem... Most of the theories have this, ha have, to, have this problem. They may not realize it, okay? But let's take Helmholtz, okay? If he wants to say that we take into account the illumination, he was thinking about a change of illumination over time. But the real problem is illumination changes over space. So here's uh, uh, an, uh, the apartment of uh, my student, Elias Akonimu, in, in, in Greece, in, on Crete. And there's three illumination levels. There's the outdoor scene here, 
there's the balcony there, which has less illumination, and there's the inside of the apartment, which has even lower illumination, LF3. LF3. You see this? You recognize this? Ah. Oh, she doesn't speak English. She's not even going to know what I'm saying, but she'll recognize it anyway. Um, so if, 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 if you're Helmholtz and you're going to estimate the illumination, you have to estimate a different level of illumination in each of those regions, and that means you have to find out where the regions are. So this is not just my problem, okay? We all have this problem. I mean, you people in size don't have this problem, but... Okay, but there's, there's been a problem that's been bothering me for a while called... We call it the hypercompression problem, and it goes like this. In this model, the compression of the five squares is explained by global anchoring, okay? So, according to the theory, if you did nothing but local anchoring in the five squares, you'd see things vertically, but because in the global framework they all look like white surfaces, uh, you com it's, that, it's that horizontal line that, when combined, when, when merged with the other line, gives you your compression. But what that means is that if your spotlight is 30 times brighter than the room light, the ambient light, that's all the compression you're going to get. The compression is maxed out because this line can't go up anymore, okay? But we know that that's not true empirically, okay? So just to show you that, we recently did the following experiment. Um, first of all, we re-ran we re the baseline condition uh, where the spotlight was 30 times brighter than the room light. Then we did a condition where the room light was four times lower. And then we also did a condition where the spotlight was four times higher. So here's the data. So here's the compression we got with the standard baseline condition. And for the other two conditions, we, that's what we mean by hypercompression. We got significantly more compression that directly contradicts the anchoring model. So that was a little bit of a problem, especially because this was exactly the phenomenon that led to the anchoring theory, and <laughs> I realized that the theory doesn't even explain that. So, without going into too many details, I'll just mention briefly, I talked about this last year at Bremen, I'm sure you all memorized my talk, and uh, we had built a new vision tunnel, and on the inside, we had a checkerboard pattern, we could either have a high-range checkerboard or a low-range checkerboard, and the five squares could either have a high range or a low range, and that allowed us to test six different suggested metrics that people had suggested that might be the cause of the compression, such as, for example, David Brainerd suggested it's the overall luminance range in your entire visual field. That was one of the six, okay? Well, we got a clear winner, and that was that the compression was predicted by the ratio between the highest luminance in the local framework and the highest luminance in the global framework. Now, that's not what the anchoring theory says, okay? The anchoring theory says that you do, you do co-determination for every one of the squares. And that model failed, okay? And this is the metric that, that, that successfully predicted the amount of compression. It predicted it very, very well. And by the way, this is a, uh, I think you can regard this as a surrogate for the perceived illumination difference between the spotlight and the rest of the room, since we know that uh, illumination depends on the highest luminance. So, to try to wrap this up, uh, both layer models and framework models have important strengths, and uh, even though I'm currently working on, uh, you know, working with a framework model, uh, I, I think there's a lot of value in these, in these uh, layer models. Uh, I sort of hated to give up my layer model, um, but that's where the data seemed to point at that time. But I, I there are some some e experiments, there are some tests where a layer model performs better than a, than a framework model. And I think that it must be possible to integrate these two kinds of models. Uh, but I don't see any way to do it at present because, you know, the units of analysis are so different. Layers and frameworks seem so different. And uh, if you can suggest how we could put these two models together, uh, I'm interested. So, uh, to uh, try to conclude, uh, I, I want to argue that sensations don't exist. It's time to give them up. Cognitive influences are greatly exaggerated, I believe. Uh, the two-stage models are really lacking support. Uh, I would agree with uh, uh, Polition and Fodor that uh, vision is largely modular and uh, not easily penetrated by cognition, or maybe not at all. 
Illumination level doesn't have to be estimated. Grouping by illumination is sufficient and, in fact, more consistent with the empirical data, I would suggest. And layers and frameworks need integrating. So I want to thank uh, uh, Sanchitza, of course, uh, Anna Radonic, who uh, is currently working with David Brainerd, uh, and uh, Steve, Steve Ivory, currently in my lab, uh, Alessandro Saranzo, many of you know him. And here's my undergraduate assistant who's working on the chicks, uh, Katerina Yevtic. And thank you very much for your attention. So under these low luminance conditions, <laughs> it, yeah. uh, uh, we, we can ask a technician to turn the lights on a oh, little yeah, bit that's true. to see Alan s sweating on the stage. So this is just, a, uh, I'm wondering about your impression. Uh, the anchoring theory seems very interesting in lightness perception. And I remember uh, reading a paper a few years ago about Oi, He and Wu suggesting something like anchoring in integrating uh, uh, surfaces in distance perception. So I'm just wondering about your intu intuition. Do you expect something like anchoring to be more general rule, not just in lightness perception, maybe in other visual aspects and visual um, characteristics? Thank you for that softball, Oliver. Uh, yes, I, that's a great, I love that question. Uh, and I want to try to take as much time answering it before Mark gets a chance to <laughs> ask me his question. No, I think Absolutely, I think that anchoring is, in fact, a general problem. And I think the best analogy would be motion perception. And I think in motion perception, uh, we all recognize the concept of anchoring because, you know, uh, we don't just see relative motion, right? We see some things as stationary. And there, the, the anchor is more obvious. The anchor is the thing that's stationary. Whereas in lightness, it's not immediately obvious why white should be the anchor. There is an explanation for that. but. Uh, Motion perception is a great example. And by the way, I should have mentioned uh, Carl Dunker, because you've got to read Dunker's uh, chapter on, on induced motion. Uh, he not only talks about anchoring in the motion domain, but he talks about frames of reference. I mean, Kafka and Dunker were always talking about frames of reference. I think it's very powerful stuff. And uh, it's, it's just a wonderful read. So absolutely, and I think it would apply to size. I mean, there are certain situations where you need an anchor for size, and I don't know if that question has been completely answered. So, yes. Go ahead, Mark. Hi, Alan. Oh, uh, and for those that don't know who I am, I'm the evil person in the, in the talk. Mark Mr. Mr. O'Dog. Um, it was great talk, Alan. Um, Thank you. And um, it, it, I scarcely know where to begin uh, in <laughs> responding to it, but um, I would mention that there are cogent counter arguments to most of the arguments you made. But the one thing I wanted to, to get your uh, idea on is that, as you know, I've made the case on a number of occasions that um, brightness is important. Um, lightness, that is to say, the ground truth, the surface reflectance, isn't the only thing in the world worth knowing. Um, that uh, shape from shading, um, shadow boundaries, all of these things are, uh, play, a, play a role. And if you don't have brightness perception, you won't know what those are. Um, and the second thing I'll say is that... Can, can I respond to that first? Sure. Just let me, uh, two things. Uh, I did want to make, I'm glad you said that, I want to make a, a distinction. If you're talking about, let's say, the, the brightness of a light bulb, then yes, I say brightness perception is, is, is it's, a, it's a distal property, and that's different. And I should have made that point earlier. I was more talking about brightness perception when you have different levels of illumination in the same scene. So of course, brightness in that sense is important. Uh, and the second thing about shape from shading, uh, I don't see why you need brightness. I don't see why you need to know luminance. You have gradients. Shape from shading is a matter of gradients. I thought that's what I was talking about. Well, you say gradi gradients of luminance, right? But we have no direct access to luminance. I mean, in a Kantian sense, that's the noumenal realm. 
what you we see we do, is a gradation of brightness. Agree. We do or we don't have access to luminance. We don't have direct access to luminance, right? What we have access to is the uh, retinally processed luminance distribution. Right. right. So you can't right. talk about direct access to luminance. It, it has to have, be mediated by some st processing stage, which we call brightness. Yeah, fair enough. Now, you disagree with it. But secondly, um, a lot of the uh, examples you gave uh, were, uh, for lightness, uh, were really, we would agree, we would call them lightness too, because lightness and brightness are completely 100% um, correlated collapse. under homogeneous illumination. Right, under so, homogeneous yeah. illumination, they're the same thing. I, we agree on that, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sasha. Can you switch on this? Uh, this one, maybe, huh? Uh, first of all, I have a question. Do you see the same apparent illuminations for all squares, or different? Do I see the same illumination on all five Ap squares? Yeah, apparent illumination. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's my experience, yes. Yeah, and the physical uh, light is homogeneous, right? It is, yes. So, why then this is a problem for their theory? Because the leftmost square looks dimmer in apparent illumination, so it looks uh, lighter in uh, lightness. And the rightmost looks uh, brighter in apparent illumination. And of course it looks uh, different. So you have here uh, not the contradiction to the layer theory or intrinsic theory. You have a good example supporting this. Only if you start thinking not about uh, physical illumination or physical light intensity, but apparent illumination. It's just a, um, yeah, albedo theory, al al albedo invariance. Why didn't you tell me that 20 years ago, Sasha? You're I gonna, did. You've got to save me a lot of trouble. I told you at yeah, R19. But, yeah, but who listens, you know? <laughs> uh, okay, well... <laughs> To answer what, why, it's a, why I think it's a problem for at least my intrinsic image theory is this. Uh, so my intrinsic image theory says that you, you, you categorize these edges as reflectance edges, and then you integrate them, right? Well, when you integrate all these edges, these luminance ratios from here to here, you end up with an integrated ratio of 30 to 1. And if this is 30 and that's white, then this has to be black, because that's the relationship between, between 30 and 1. Huh? This logic implies equal illumination, equal apparent illumination. Oh. Oh, I see. So you're saying, okay, okay, if, if I get your drift, you may be suggesting that people perceive a gradient of illumination across them. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, as a matter of fact, there's some truth to that. <laughs> Okay, you caught me now. <laughs> there is some truth to that. And the fact of the matter is that uh, if we scramble the five squares, it eliminates half of the compression. Perhaps I should have mentioned that. <laughs> but I didn't have the time, you know. I, I, time constraints. <laughs> Uh, so, so uh, that's a very good point, and as, as a matter of fact, that is a point in favor of layer models, okay? It eliminates half, and so you notice that in the experiments we did, we, we use scrambled uh, squares. Uh, and if you're not following the logic, let me just unpack it. If, if you perceive a gradient of illumination with brighter illumination here and dimmer illumination here, then it's sort of consistent with the idea that the range of grays doesn't have to be as great, because you can account for some of that range with the illumination and the rest of the range with, with shades of gray. Now, it is a, still a problem for intrinsic image theory, though, because, because the, it's still the case that the integrated ratio is 30 to 1. So that's a stubborn fact that is not consistent with this idea of perceiving a gradient of illumination. <laughs> 
Well, we'll have to, we'll have to work that out over beers. Uh, but, you know, uh, this is just, I guess, one more reason why uh, we may have, I'm trying to find some way to integrate these, these, these two layer and, and framework models. Oh, I'm sorry, there's hands, yes. Is that Fred? Absolutely. The thing about the staircase Gelb effect that you, this is a lovely demonstration, is why is it that th all the theory has to explain is why the, the ratios between the various, the five disks is 30 to 1, but you don't see that. Why shouldn't the theory also have to, ex have to take into account the ratios of each of those patches with its background? They're all brighter, or higher luminance, than the background. Those are ratios too. Surely those have to be taken into account for any theory. And when you take them into account, it's, couldn't it just be explained by local contrast? Well, uh, no. I mean, I think that the, the ratio between each square and whatever's in the background is, is kind of irrelevant. I mean, what, what meaning does the ratio between this and something back there? I mean, there's no reason to think these are, are they're coplanar, they're divided by sharp edges. Uh, it's a very strong assumption that they're getting the same amount of light, or they're at least in the continuous gradient. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense that we use ratios of things that are coplanar. Actually, I think I wrote that years ago. Yeah. Um, so but, neur but neurons are looking at the, uh, 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 at the neurons are also taking into account the background. Well, I, I don't know anything about neurons, but, um, <laughs> you know, but... Uh, isn't it logical that uh, isn't it logical that these ratios here are more important than say ratios here? I don't think so. I think they're both equally important. Well, I mean, empirically, you're right that things are, as as Cardosh pointed out, they are related to the to the foreign field. Yeah. But uh, there's something irrational about that. I mean, uh, it seems to me logically you would think that an inclusion boundary. See, if you have a cast edge, if you have a cast illumination edge, that tells you exactly how much the illumination changes, right? And even if you have a corner, you can make a, f a fairly modest assumption that the, that the reflectance might be the same around the corner. But when you have an occlusion edge, the illumination on the two sides of an occlusion edge is not going to be the same except by coincidence. So it seems to me it's a very strong assumption to assume that at every occlusion edge, there must at least be some component of illumination difference. And you don't have that with these edges. Okay. You, you ha if you're going to make the assumption that this edge here is partly a reflectance edge and partly an illumination edge, I think that's quite a coincidence. Yeah. I think we have to stop. Let's continue over beers. I feel like I need to chime in at this point. I was going to remain silent, but following up on Fred's point, in the original experiment that you did with Cataglione, um, I reanalyzed your data. I published this in Journal of Vision. And you can explain the compression effect, at least in that experiment, by a, a model that says that it's only the comparison with the background that's determining the, the compression and you get Stephen's brightness law, you're oh arguing God. against brightness, for the, for the scale that you get. Now, I'm not arguing that it's really just brightness, but I agree with Fred that there's some neural process that's compressing the relationship between the, the dark background and the lighter individual papers. In fact, when you were putting things up, People may disagree with this, but I think it'd be interesting if you just look at the darkest paper and keep looking at that as you take away all the other papers, does it really change in appearance? Or is there some kind of higher level judgment that you're making in deciding that uh, it's white to begin with, it's the same white to begin with, that that really bright paper is after you've introduced the entire staircase. Well, I, I agree that there's a, there's a kind of a paradox in the sense that this first square, you never see it changing, even though at the beginning it looks white and at the end it looks gray, even though it never really in some sense changed. But uh, I'm not sure what to make of that. Now, uh, uh, as far as, uh, see, what was, you had another point. What was your other point? Well, 
Well, look, I do want to talk about this further because uh, I am absolutely open to other explanations of the compression. You know, I've been asking, a number of you know, I've sent emails around saying, can you think of another explanation for compression? So I'm, I'm open, you know, to other explanations. And uh, yeah, what can I say? I'd like to hear more. I don't have anything relevant to contribute, but I thought this was a splendid beginning of this meeting. I hope of many, many more of these discussions, but maybe for, for now, we should change the venue. Thank you okay. very much. <laughs> <laughs>